Hi there, speedy readers, and thanks for joining me again for another exciting instalment of Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. Now, I'm going to cut straight to the chase. I've got 15 minutes. The stopwatch is poised for action. Um, we've got some high-class literature coming your way, and I'm going to do my best uh, to read it. So it might be a low-quality rendition, but it's high-quality writing. All right, so here we go, 15 minutes from now. <laughs> Children from the slums were easy enough to entice away, but eventually people noticed, and the police were stirred into reluctant action. For a while, there were no more bewitchings, but a rumour had been born, and little by little it changed and grew and spread. And when, after a while, a few children disappeared in Norwich, and then Sheffield, and then Manchester, the people in those places who'd heard of the disappearances elsewhere added the new vanishings to the story and gave it new strength. And so, the legend grew of a mysterious group of enchanters who spirited children away. Some said their leader was a beautiful lady. Others said a tall man with red eyes, while a third story told of a youth who laughed and sang to his victims so that they followed him like sheep. As for where they took these lost children, no two stories agreed. Some said it was to hell, underground, to fairyland. Others said to a farm where the children were kept and fattened for the table. Others said that the children were kept and sold as slaves to rich Tartars, and so on. But one thing on which everyone agreed was the name of these invisible kidnappers. They had to have a name, or not to be referred to at all, and talking about them, especially if you were safe and snug at home, or in Jordan College, was delicious. And the name that seemed to settle on them without anyone's knowing why was the Gobblers. Don't stay out late, or the Gobblers will get you. My cousin in Northampton, she knows a woman whose little boy was took by the Gobblers. The Gobblers have been in Stratford. They say they're coming south. And inevitably, let's play kids and gobblers. So said Lyra to Roger, the kitchen boy from Jordan College. He would have followed her to the ends of the earth. How do you play that? You have to hide and I find you and slice you open right like the gobblers do. You don't know what they do. They might not do that at all. You're afraid of them, she said. I can tell. I ain't. I don't believe in them anyway. I do, she said decisively. But I ain't afraid either. I just do what my uncle done last time he came to Jordan. I seen him. He was in the retiring room and there was this guest who weren't polite and my uncle just give him a hard look and the man fell dead on the spot with all foam and froth round his mouth. He never, said Roger doubtfully. They never said anything about that in the kitchen. Anyway, you weren't allowed in the retiring room. Of course not. They wouldn't tell servants about a thing like that, and I have been in the retiring room, so there. Anyway, my uncle's always doing that. He'd done it to some Tartars when they caught him once. He tied him up and they was going to cut his guts out, but when the first man come up with the knife, my uncle just looked at him and he fell dead. So another one come up and he'd done the same to him and finally there was only one left. My uncle said he'd leave him alive if he untied him, so he did. And then my uncle killed him anyway, just so as to teach him a lesson. <laughs> Roger was less sure about that than the gobblers, but the story was too good to waste, so they took it in turns to be Lord Asriel and the expiring Tartars, using Sherbert Dip for the phone. However, that was a distraction. Lyra was still intent on playing gobblers, and she inveigled, she inveigled, inveigled, I'll have to check this word, she inveigled Roger down into the wine cellars where they entered by means of the butler's spare set of keys. Together, they crept through the great vaults where the college's Tokay and Canary, its Burgundy and Brantwyn were lying under the cobwebs of ages. Ancient stone arches rose above them, supported by pillars as thick as trees. Irregular flagstones lay underfoot, and on all sides were ranged rack upon rack, tier upon tier, of bottles and barrels. It was fascinating. With gobblers forgotten again, the two children tiptoed from end to end, holding a candle in trembling fingers, peering into every dark corner, with a single question growing more urgent in Lyra's mind every moment. What did the wine taste like? There was an easy way of answering this. Lyra, over Roger's fervent protests, picked out the oldest, twistiest, greenest bottle she could find, and, not having anything to extract the cork with, broke it off at the neck. 
Huddled in the furthest corner, they sipped at the heady crimson liquor, wondering when they'd become drunk, and how they'd tell when they were. Lyra didn't like the taste much, but she had to admit how grand and complicated it was. The funniest thing was watching their two demons, who seemed to be getting more and more muddled, falling over, giggling senselessly, and changing shape to look like gargoyles, each trying to be uglier than the other. Finally, and almost simultaneously, the children discovered what it was like to be drunk. Do they like doing this? gasped Robber. Uh, Robber? gasped Roger after vomiting copiously. Yes, said Lyra in the same condition. And so do I, she added stubbornly. Lyra learned nothing from that episode, except that playing gobblers led to interesting places. She remembered her uncle's words in their last interview and began to explore underground for what was above ground was only a small fraction of the whole. Like some enormous fungus whose root system extended over acres, Jordan, finding itself jostling for space above ground with St Michael's College on one side, Gabriel College on the other, and the university library behind, had begun. Sometime in the Middle Age, to spread below the surface. Tunnels, shafts, vaults, cellars, staircases had so hollowed out the earth below Jordan, and for several hundred yards around it, that there was almost as much air below ground as above. Jordan College stood on a sort of froth of stone. And now that Lyra had the taste for exploring it, she abandoned her usual haunt, the irregular alps of the college roofs, and plunged with Roger into this netherworld. From playing at gobblers, she had turned to hunting them, for what could be more likely than that they were lurking out of sight below the ground? So one day she and Roger made their way into the crypt below the oratory. This was where generations of masters had been buried, each in his lead-lined oak coffin in niches along the stone walls. A stone tablet began, uh, sorry, a stone tablet below each space gave their names. Simon Leclerc, master from 1765 to 1789, Cerebaton Requison in Pass. What does that mean? said Roger. Well, the first part's his name and the last bit's Roman. And there's the dates in the middle when he was master, and the other name must be his demon. They moved along the silent vault, tracing the letters of more inscriptions. Francis Lyle, master 1748 to 1765, Zoharial, Requiescent in Pass. Ignatius Cole, Master, 1745 to 1748, Musca, Requiescent in On each coffin, Lyra was interested to see a brass plaque bore of, bore a different, oh sorry, a brass plaque bore a picture of a different being. This one a basilisk, this one a cat, this one a serpent, this one a monkey. She realised that they were images of the dead man's demons. As people became adult, their demons lost the power to change and assumed one shape, keeping it permanently. These coffins got skeletons in them, whispered Roger. Mouldering flesh, whispered Lyra. And worms and maggots, all twisting about in their eye sockets. Must be ghosts down here, said Roger, shivering pleasantly. Beyond the first crypt, they found a passage lined with stone shelves. Each shelf was partitioned off into square sections, and in each section rested a skull. Roger's demon, tail tucked firmly between her legs, shivered against him and gave a little quiet howl. Hush, he said. Lyra couldn't see Pam, but she knew his moth form was resting on her shoulder and probably shivering too. She reached up and lifted the nearest skull gently out of its resting place. What are you doing, said Roger. You ain't supposed to touch him. She turned it over and over, taking no notice. Something suddenly fell out of the hole at the base of the skull fell through her fingers and rang as it hit the floor, and she nearly dropped the skull in alarm. It's a coin, said Roger, feeling for it. Might be treasure. He held it up to the candle, and they both gazed wide-eyed. It was not a coin, but a little disc of bronze, with a crudely engraved inscription showing a cat. It's like the ones in the coffins, said Lyra. It's his demon, must be. Better put it back said Roger uneasily, and Lyra upturned the skull and dropped the disc back into its immemorial resting place, before returning the skull to the shelf. Each of the other skulls they found had its own demon coin, showing its own as lifetime companion, still close to them in death. Who do you think these were when they were alive, said Lyra? Probably scholars, I reckon. Only the masters get coffins. There's probably been so many scholars all down the centuries that there wouldn't be room to bury the whole of them. 
so they just cut their heads off and keep them. That's the most important part of them anyway. They found no gobblers, but the catacombs under the oratory kept Lyra and Roger busy for days. Once she tried to play a trick on some of the dead scholars by switching around their coins in their skulls so that they were wrong, so that they were with the wrong demons. Pan became so agitated at this that he changed into a bat and flew up and down, uttering shrill cries and flapping his wings in her face, but she took no notice. It was too good a joke to waste. She paid for it later, though. In bed in her narrow room at the top of Staircase 12, she was visited by a night gust and woke up screaming at the three robed figures who stood at the bedside, pointing their bony fingers before throwing back their cowls to show bleeding stumps where their heads should have been. Only when Pan became a lion and roared at them did they retreat, backing away into the substance of the wall until all that was visible was their arms, then their horny yellow-grey hands, then their twitching fingers, and then nothing. First thing in the morning, she hastened down to the catacombs and restored the demon coins to the rightful places and whispered, sorry, sorry, to the skulls. The catacombs were much larger than the wine cellars, but they too had a limit. When Lyra and Roger had explored every corner of them and were sure there were no gobblers to be found, they turned their attention elsewhere. But not before they were spotted leaving the crypt by the intercessor who called them back to the oratory. The intercessor was a plump, elderly man known as Father Heist. It was his job to lead all the college services, to preach and pray and hear confessions. When Lyra was younger, he had taken an interest in her spiritual welfare, only to be confounded by her sly indifference and insincere repentances. She was not spiritually promising, he had decided. When they heard him call, Lyra and Roger turned reluctantly and walked, dragging their feet into the great musty-smelling dimness of the oratory. Candles flickered here, and there, in front of the images of saints, a faint and distant clatter came from the organ loft, where some repairs were going on. A servant was polishing the brass lectern. Father Heist, Father Heist beckoned from the vestry door. Where have you been? he said to them. I've seen you come in here two or three times now. What are you up to? His tone was not accusatory. He sounded as if he were genuinely interested. His demon flicked a lizard tongue at them from her perch on his shoulder. Lyra said, we wanted to look down in the crypt. Whatever for? The, the coffins. We wanted to see all the coffins, she said. But why? She shrugged. It was her constant response when she was pressed. And you, he went on, turning to Roger. Roger's demon anxiously wagged her terrier tail to prop it, prop it, prop it, prop it, prop it, Another one to look up. What's your name? Roger, father. If you're a servant, where do you work? In the kitchen, father. Should you be there now? Yes, father. Then be off with you. Roger turned and ran. Lyra dragged her foot from side to side on the floor. As for you, Lyra, said Father Heist, I'm pleased to see you're taking an interest in what lies in the oratory. You are a lucky child to have all this history around you. Hmm, said Lyra. But I wonder about your choice of companions. Are you a lonely child? No, she said. Do you, do you miss the society of other children? No. I don't mean Roger the kitchen boy, I mean children such as yourself, nobly born children. Would you like to have some companions of that sort? No. But other girls, perhaps? No. You see, none of us would want you to miss all the usual childhood pleasures and pastimes. I sometimes think it must be a lonely life for you here among a company of elderly scholars, Lyra. Do you feel that? No. He tapped his thumbs together over his interlaced fingers, unable to think of anything else to ask this stubborn child. If there is anything troubling you, he said finally, you know you can come and tell me about it. I'm the fox. I'm the fox. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> okay, we're almost done. I hope you can feel you can always do that. Yes, she said. Do you say your prayers? Yes. Good girl. Well, run along. With a barely concealed sigh of relief, she turned and left, having failed to find the gobblers below ground. Lyra took to the streets again. She was at home there. Then, almost when she'd lost interest in them, 
the gobblers appeared in Oxford. Let me just turn this time it. Uh. All right, well, we've got 15 seconds to go, but that is a really good place to stop. Mark it, mark it now. So, the gobblers coming to Oxford, and I think Lyra is going to find out all about them. Oh, my goodness me. I, ho I hope you're enjoying it, because I certainly am, and I've forgotten so much of this wonderful book. Um, and there we go. There we go. So, it's time for me to check out, and I'll see you next time for another speedy read. All right, later! For you know we are right, we must strike at the lies that all spread like disease to our